Okay, um, all right, so uh, let me just uh, first introduce you to the organizing committee. Besides myself, it is uh, Sasha, maybe, why don't you guys stand up? Sasha, uh, Rohi, and, and Mike. So uh, we have put this together and obviously this would not have been possible with all of you. I want to uh, thank, um, beside Marine and Coastal Sciences, also the Department of Geography, the Rutgers Climate Institute, and also the uh, Social and Behavioral Dean uh, within the School of Arts and Sciences that has uh, provided support for this event. And uh, in this, this afternoon, after lunch, there will be a, a keynote lecture with uh, Rick Forster, who's here in the back. You want to like, wave to everyone? He has done some really amazing research um, uh, in Greenland, essentially uh, uh, inspired a whole new uh, field of inquiry. And he's giving a talk this afternoon after lunch. So I hope you all always stay for that. And that's part of uh, the distinguished lecture series of the Social and Behavioral Dean uh, within SAS. Uh, although perhaps not so much social and behavioral science in, in that talk. I don't know. Greenland, Greenland aquifer behavior. Yeah. Okay, um, anyway, uh, before we start uh, with, with uh, Liz's uh, talk, I want to give the word to, to Todd, who's just going to encourage you to talk to him. <laughs> so. This will be a 30 second pitch. Uh, I'm Todd Bates, I, I'm a science communicator for Rutgers Communications, and I'm a former uh, 30 year environmental writer at the Asbury Park Press, and I want to promote your research to journalists. That's what I do. I'm a, your friendly neighborhood media, rela media relations guy. So I, please contact me. There's my card. If you have studies in the works, uh, let me know as early as possible. And uh, we might decide to write about it, line up videos, photos, and pitch to journalists. I, uh, I have an embargo study uh, um, in science on Thursday that, that uh, could get, make a big splash. Anyway. Please get in touch and tell me what you're doing. Great. Thank you so much, Todd. So I think with that, we should uh, get started. And uh, we'll start with, uh, with Liz. So let me see. You, I guess. Full screen? Yeah. It's like when you're up here, it's like I can't see anything. I also have... Uh, this is a slide advancer and a, and a pointer, so if you want to, you can Try use, not to hit the wrong button. You can right? also, yeah, don't hit the, and you can also use that's, the. That's the, yeah. yeah. Okay. All right, I'm going to start this. I'm gonna oh, start. you're going to start me. Okay. All right, you're ready? I'm ready. You're ready. I'm ready. Okay. okay. Go. So for the last decade or so, I've been working in the Southern Ocean trying to understand carbon sequestration, so keeping the carbon, oh, it doesn't show up on the screen keeping how the carbon CO2 in the atmosphere is sequestered in the deep ocean and how that changes from with climate. So primarily, I've been working in the, um, sorry, I can't see it on there. It's a useless pointer. Apparently. Okay, so the, I've been working around New Zealand and what we've been doing is, and, and I've just recently uh, been collaborating with colleagues um, who have been working in the Atlantic, so that's uh, off of uh, South America there, to compare depth transects of cores to recreate what Physical oceanographers can go out and put a CTD over the side and tell you what the layers of the ocean looks like. We have to collect cores, so those dots are the core depths, and then we can recreate um, depth transects of the ocean in the past to understand changes in structure. And where we've just come back from is the Indian Ocean. Um, and so what we do, advance, okay. What we do is, so on the left is a figure of the um, C13, that's our marker for CO2. More CO2 is to the left and less CO2 is to the right and what you can see is in the black dots that's the Pacific lots of CO2 at depth because um, it's sequestered there and coming out of the Atlantic is low CO2 in the ocean and this on the right is a figure of a slide uh, is a is what we recreated from cores and the important thing in that figure is the change in depth of those those um, boluses. So in the Pacific today we have a deep bolus of CO2 and on the Atlantic we have none and it's shallower in the LGM in the Atlantic and deeper in the Pacific. Solid line is Pacific, dotted line is Atlantic. Um, and so we did that study and the important thing here is, is we looked at that and we said why? So today the yellow arrow is North Atlantic deep water coming out of the Atlantic 
filling the Southern Ocean, and it takes that trajectory around. So when it comes out of the Southern, out of the Atlantic, little red circle there is the Atlantic study area. It has little CO2 as it traverses along, the biopump fills it up with CO2, and by the time we get to New Zealand, it's full of CO2. But in the past, those depths were different, the amounts were different, and there's a big southern ocean between the uh, Atlantic and New Zealand. So we went back, we proposed, and what we're doing now, I've just come back from a 48-day cruise to the Indian Ocean, where that circle is, because deep water comes down, those light blue arrows are the deep water coming down and filling those basins from the Atlantic, and the surface water is going the other way. So in order to understand Yellow Star is our stars are where the previous study was. To understand those differences, we need to be in the Indian Ocean. So that's where I'm going now. We've just come back. Oh, there were three slides there showing you how we took these cores that got overwritten when the animation came out. But that's the core. So that's OK. Hero pictures of people at sea. Imagine them carrying cores, bringing things in. But what I will say, so we went back for more cores. We've come back with 36 cores. And we spend a lot of time looking at the rarest albatrosses in the world while we're doing that. And I'm only two seconds over. Fantastic. Wow, that doesn't. OK, so yeah, you, it seems like you can use the mouse maybe as a pointer. Um, great. It, the, the, so they didn't, they didn't give you a ding at the end then, I guess. I have to like work on this. You could hear it. Okay, great. I want everyone to hear it. Uh, let's see. Can I change it to something intense? Ding. Boxing bell. That's what we want. All right. Okay, so um, next speaker, Ben. Oh, I could actually hear that. Um, so I'm Ben Lintner. I'm a professor in environmental science. I study uh, uh, climate variability, and most of the time I study climate in the tropics. But I was fortunate to have a postdoc, uh, Kyle Clem, who's pictured uh, in the picture there, uh, who's interested in looking at connections between tropical variability and Antarctic climate. So Kyle did his PhD in New Zealand, looking at trends in Antarctic climate over recent decades. And so uh, this is essentially his work. He's on vacation right now. So, uh, and I guess since we're being recorded, I can't make fun of him. Um, but if you have any questions, you can direct them to Kyle. So what we were interested in in this work was to consider how uh, the observed Antarctic climate variability in various records, you can see them uh, in the, the figure there, um, how, they, how the, the trends appear to have shifted in recent decades. So, in the Antarctic Peninsula, um, the sea ice uh, has, or the Antarctic Peninsula temperatures in recent decades since around 2000 have cooled. Sea ice has increased, whereas in, in central, uh, or sorry, in the Ross Ice Shelf, um, the opposite trend seems to have, have been happening since 2000. And what Kyle noticed, this goes back to his PhD work, is that these, these shifts around the year 2000 seem to all be con coincident with a shift in a mode of decadal variability in the Pacific, the interdecadal Pacific Oscillation, which you can see pictured there at the bottom, shifted phase from positive in the earlier part of the record to uh, negative in the later part. So we were interested in, in looking at how this IPO variability, uh, which uh, happens in the Pacific, may have been affecting the Antarctic climate. And so these figures show on the top panel the relationship between sea surface temperature variability in ENSO in the, the tropics. No surprise, ENSO is the dominant driver of interannual variability. But this decadal scale variability in the IPO, which in some sense is a kind of broader uh, pattern of ENSO, exerts a very strong control. And you can see the, the gray circled region there is in an area known as the South Pacific Convergent Zone, where uh, with this IPO shift, there's been a warming of uh, sea surface temperature there uh, post 2000. And so what Kyle was interested in doing is complementing the observational work that he's done previously by doing some model experiments. He set up the NCAR model uh, and forced the NCAR model with uh, sea surface temperature variability in that part of the SPCZ and essentially found circulation patterns that seem to be plausible in explaining this, this shift. Um, one of the interesting things about these circulation patterns is that 
even though the forcing is maintained as constant, it varies over Activity seasonal. Completed. It varies over seasonal timescales, and so that seems to be connected to the dynamics of the large-scale circulation and jet in the southern hemisphere. So if you have any questions, you can follow up with Kyle when he comes back from vacation next week. Yeah, it wasn't a boxing bell, but I think it was effective. <laughs> I think I'll keep it. All right. Um, Enrique, here you go. Morning. Um, I'm Enrique Cortator. I'm at the Department of Environmental Sciences here, uh, mostly working on, on ocean problems. Um, I'm just going to tell you very generally uh, what myself and lab and collaborators do. What you're looking here in the background is a picture from thermal imagery. So the dark spots are um, cold, so they're leads, they're um, cold water, the white ones are um, our sea ice, um, and if you look carefully, you can see some clouds and, and things like that. Um, and um, this is a really, uh, this is up in the Arctic, and it's a difficult uh, environment in which to sample, especially if you're interested in the ocean and subsurface um, processes. So uh, what myself and my lab, um, among, other, um, among others, are doing is we're trying to model um, these processes, and um, one thing that, that you can gather from a picture such as this is that um, there is large scale influence, so we know the climate is impacting the general ice cover in the Arctic, but there's also some very local processes. So if you're interested about what's going to happen, for example, um, with drilling um, offshore or, or with fisheries or ecosystems, you need to be able to bring this down to, um, to scales that um, are appropriate for that. So what we do in my lab is we, we are develop models, and here's um, on your left you see um, a, a series of models, the way we work. We start modeling the whole Arctic system um, down to, to subarctic latitudes, and then we use that to generate the overall climate um, of the ocean for a particular period of time, typically 40, 50 years, and then we downscale that um, progressively to, to finer and finer resolution models, where um, the one on your bottom left is, um, is um, sub, so better than one kilometer resolution models that resolves all the inlets and barrier islands and land fast ties. Um, this was uh, from a study we did for the um, Department of Interior that they used to do their environmental impact studies um, before they, um, they do their leases for oil drilling. And on your right is just um, a neat way of comparing two observations where each dot represents, um, you get the sense of what the resolution of the observations are relative to the grids that we are resolving. So um, with these kinds of models over the years, uh, we have done many papers. We're interested in the ecosystem. We're interested in the connection between the Bering Sea and the Arctic through the Chukchi and ultimately in the Beaufort Sea. And um, you can see we, we've done work on, on, on fisheries, uh, looking at how these currents um, are transporting um, larvae into, um, into, from the Gulf of Alaska into the Bering Sea and ultimately into the Arctic. Um, how the central Beaufort gyre is connected to the Bering Sea through some physical waves um, that are traveling. So um, lots and lots of work. Activity that has, completed. Indeed. Um, lots and lots of work that we did over, um, over the years. I'm happy to chat with people on this. Great. <laughs> All right, we're going to switch uh, to a, a PowerPoint now because of your video. <laughs> and maybe I <laughs> should actually <laughs> change that to see if I can figure that out. Um, All right. Oh. oh, sorry. There we go. <laughs> Thanks. I didn't even see that. Uh, let me just see if I can. Do I have bonus seconds? Um, you're not <laughs> losing any seconds. You get, you get a few extra seconds. Maybe I'll do so. All right. well, I'll just start and say I'm, I'm Becca Jackson. I'm new faculty here. Just started a few weeks ago. Um, and now. <laughs> and uh, you know, broadly, I'm a physical oceanographer. I'm interested in the high latitude coasts and particularly where ocean and ice meet, like shown in this picture. Um, 
kind of the large scale motivation for a lot of my work is trying to understand the interaction between the ocean and cryosphere in, in both directions. So for example, the Greenland ice sheet and the North Atlantic. Um, so from the ocean perspective, the ice sheet is a source of fresh water that has implications for sea level rise and ocean circulation. And the other direction, the ocean, ocean is a driver of submarine melting um, and potentially glacier retreat. So a lot of the questions I address kind of boil down to understanding um, the exchanges of fresh water and heat uh, near glaciers. So this is a schematic of sort of a typical glacier in Greenland flowing in from the right. It's a little bit faded. Um, and this is kind of a schematic of a fjord where you have the glacier depositing fresh water in various liquid forms and also as solid icebergs. Um, so we have this export of fresh water into the ocean and then you have an import of heat from the ocean to melt ice. And that submarine melting is thought to be kind of a critical link between ocean variability and glacier variability. Um, so my work has explored these driver, or, uh, the drivers of these freshwater and heat exchanges, um, kind of a variety of scales, looking at um, wind forcing, coastal trapped waves from the shelf, uh, buoyancy forcing from the freshwater itself, um, and again, from kind of large scale regional perspective, um, down to recently I've been really focused on the small scale turbulent processes right at the ocean glacier interface where you have plumes that drive melting, and those plumes also control the mixing of fresh water as it's exported. Um, so to study these plumes and melting, most recently I've been working with autonomous kayaks uh, that are developed at Oregon State, shown here, and to give you a sense of what this looks like in the field, you know, we have to stay back in the ship at a safe distance from the glacier, but we can send, uh-oh, it's not going forward, we can send kayaks up to the glacier. Hmm, oh, that's too bad. Um, well, yeah. what you would see, let me just see if maybe it'll show. We, we did convert it to GIF, so maybe yeah. it's not coming. Oh, okay, yeah, it probably won't show. That's okay. Yeah. Um, so big. What you would see is a little kayak driving right up to the glacier um, and surveying um, right, you know, within the first uh, tens to 100 meters uh, from the ice. And what I'm trying to do right now is, you know, use these exciting new measurements of plumes and melting to try to combined with our existing theories and um, some modeling. It should also be a little model, uh, movie, but, oh, oh well. Um, and so the big picture here is we're trying to get at, you know, improved understanding of the underwater melting of these glaciers and ultimately have a better parameterization to put into our larger scale models um, so that we can predict the evolution of glaciers and the ice sheet. Um, <laughs> so just to end, um, Broadly, my work tries to kind of bridge Activity coastal. completed. <laughs> the, <laughs> almost completed. Bridge uh, coastal and polar dynamics to understand these ocean cryosphere interactions. And I, you know, won't go through this list, but uh, maybe some words up there will catch your eye and uh, spark a future conversation. And I'm really excited to develop collaborations here at Rutgers. Yeah. <laughs> Apologize for messing up your slides. Okay. Uh, we were, I we had to look on my computer if you want to come see it. <laughs> yeah, we, we had to uh, uh, come up with a way to uh, put things together. And uh, yeah, sorry if we messed anyone's slides up. All right, but you stay up here okay, because uh, unfortunately, Nick, who's giving the next talk, is uh, not feeling well. He's sick, right? Yeah, he's got the flu. Yeah, so he's, so he's staying home and instead. Uh, you're gonna tell us about his work. Yeah, so first of all, he's really disappointed not to be here. He's excited to meet everybody. Um, that's the next step, you see him. Um, he's a new faculty in the Department of Marine and Coastal Sciences. Um, he's working with the new program in Integrated Ocean Observing. Um, and broadly, he's a high latitude physical oceanographer. Um, he's put this schematic here to kind of show three areas of his recent research. Um, so he's showing the thermohaline circulation, at least in the lower part here, where you have warm, salty Atlantic water coming north. And in one branch, um, it sinks and forms dense overflows. And he's done a lot of work on these dense overflows um, that kind of have important global uh, ocean circulation implications. And then he's also looked at kind of the other branch, the thermohaline circulation, um, where buoyancy from um, the fresh water from the Arctic and Greenland um, form this kind of surface branch of the thermohaline circulation around Greenland. And then the third area um, of his recent research is in the uh, Pacific Arctic, uh, looking at smaller scale overturning processes. And he's kind of described these as three different flavors of 
uh, polar ocean over overturning. And, and broadly, he often describes his work as being interested in water mass transformations in the polar regions. Um, so to quickly go through three of these areas, um, he's done a lot of work with gliders looking at uh, mixing in Nordic Sea overflows. So this is the Greenland-Scotland Ridge where you have um, dense overflows spilling over that are important for setting the properties of North Atlantic deep water and kind of the, have implications for the meridional overturning circulation. Um, then zooming up around to Greenland, um, he's done work tracing uh, the pathways of the fresh water that comes in from Greenland, the meltwater, as it spread um, using noble gases as tracers. And he's been looking both at the spread of this meltwater and freshwater in fjords and also out on the shelf around Greenland. And again, looking, thinking about the kind of larger scale thermohaline circulation and how these sources of fresh water impact ocean circulation. And then the third area um, that he's particularly focused on right now is in the uh, Pacific Arctic in the Chukchi Sea, um, where he's been collaborating with biogeochemists from Oregon State, um, combining really high resolution measurements of nutrients with um, microstructure turbulence measurements, trying to understand um, how nutrients are fluxed into the surface layer, um, and ultimately trying to understand you know, how that changes with um, changing summer sea ice conditions. Oh, and I actually finished early, which means Yay. I probably didn't say everything I should have. <laughs> you want to talk some more? Um, I guess I should mention that they use um, this kind of new package developed at Oregon State called CSOR, I think, that gets really high resolution in each of these sections of nutrients, turbulence, uh, both physical and biological quantities. Thank you so much. <laughs> Okay. Oh, sorry, yeah. can I say one more thing? I was supposed to yeah. advertise that he's giving a seminar in April um, to talk about his work on Greenland freshwater. Is so that in the Marine and Coastal yeah, Sciences? Yeah, Monday, 345, yeah. some date in April. Yeah, actually, you go back to the website. Yeah, it's on there a couple slides back. Yeah, April 15th. Is it? Oh. Where? Did I pass it? There it is. There. The top right corner. April 15th. Don't miss it. Tax day. Okay. Oh. Can I do the PowerPoint? Uh, do version. you need a power? Yeah, I sent two versions. One was PowerPoint. Okay. And that's the one that has the movie. Oh, it has a movie. All you right. Can't do it. Is it on the stick, Roy? <coughs> His PowerPoint. Yeah. Sorry, I thought I needed that. We'll find Later it. That I needed that. Organization. No, my stick is organization. Then you should find the trail. Oh, perfect. We'll see if it works. <clears throat> I'm Rob Shirell. I'm from the uh, Department of Marine and Coastal Sciences and Earth and Planetary Sciences. I have a joint appointment. Um, and okay. wow, that's really hard to read. Okay. Um, the primary thing that I've been looking at in my work in polar areas almost entirely in Antarctica over the last 10 years or so is at, towards answering the question has how has the increased melting of glacier ice and also changes in sea ice distribution and timing uh, affected the input of trace metals to uh, coastal Antarctic systems and how in turn are the primary producers affected by those changes in the trace metal micronutrients. So that's, and I've worked in, um, you can't really read that, but I'll just tell you, in the Amundsen Sea in Antarctica, I'll show you some pictures uh, in a minute, and on the Western Antarctic Peninsula in collaboration with the Palmer LTER program that many people in Rutgers are involved with. And also I'm beginning to do some work in Greenland as well. I've done some very recent measurements. I don't even have the data quite ready on trace metal distributions in two fjords in Western Greenland. And actually this coming Monday, I have a collaborator coming to look at trace metal distributions in a fjord in, in uh, Patagonia in Chile. So um, this is what this, green picture here is what uh, primary productivity looks like in the Amundsen Sea Polinia uh, in December of 2010. It really is that color. And so the question that we've been trying to get at is how is this shelf bloom in this Polinia area, area of open water surrounded by sea ice on the outside and continental ice affected by the increasing melting in this area. So most of Western Antarctica is draining into the Amundsen Sea. Uh, the pointer is not working. The upper pictures show you the glaciers that are entering the Amundsen Sea and how fast they've accelerated over the last couple of decades, three decades or so. 
And so this is the, uh, this one embayment is responsible for about one third of the global sea level rise right now. We went there in 2010, uh, December, January. And you can see on the right, the map on the lower right shows you the intense chlorophyll productivity of the bloom at this time of the year in the summertime, early summer, um, on the right. And we were interested in iron, which is the limiting nutrient. There's plenty of macronutrients here. Iron is a limiting nutrient. The dark blue dots all indicate very low iron concentration. So we've been trying to solve this paradox of why does this bloom get so intense, as you saw in the green picture before, and yet the iron is quite low. There has to be a continual source of iron through the whole growing season to allow this huge um, concentration of chlorophyll to uh, accumulate. What you can see here is the face of the Dotson ice shelf, one of several ice shelves that impinge on this embayment. We did intense measurements all right along that ice shelf, and uh, Pierre uh, Dutru com coming next will tell you a lot more about that kind of process. To make a long story short, we find that the circulation underneath the ice shelf is incredibly important for shooting high concentrations of iron into the polynia and the subsurface where it can get mixed up to the surface. Um, we have a model. I'm going to end here and not show you the Western Antarctic Peninsula stuff. So we've just had a paper accepted in JGR Oceans, which is this model. It's a high-resolution ROMS model of the Amundsen Sea. And you can see how the biogeochemical components and the biology develops uh, over the course of the year. It's very much dominated by the coastal current, by output from the various ice shelves, and by eddy-driven circulation uh, continuing through the summer. I'll stop there. Thank you. Okay, our visitor from Lamont. Welcome. Thank you. Uh, let's see. Hopefully, you didn't have video or no? No. no. There we go. I know how these rules. <laughs> so, hi, I'm uh, Pierre Dutrieux, and I'm the not as bright, a bit older version of Becca Jackson. Just so. Um, and while she's been, she's mostly been focusing on the Greenland ice sheet interaction with the ocean, uh, my thing has been more the Antarctic ice sheet interaction with the ocean. So I've worked uh, in the area also described by Rob a minute ago. Uh, that's me just in front of the Datsun ice shelf, indeed. Um, and so, you know, the thing that I've been working on is how, I'm a physical oceanographer, and so how does the ice interact with the ocean? Um, how does the ice sheet contribute to melt water into the ocean? Where does it contribute uh, to melt water into the ocean? Um, and then in return, how does the heat content in the ocean uh, melt the ice? Where does it melt it? How does that affect uh, ice sheet dynamics? Okay, so uh, I've used you know, a series of uh, tools and techniques to study this problem. I've used satellite observation and, you know, basically, I've used the tools that everyone else is using. So satellite observations of surface elevation that tell, gives us a clue as how thick the ice uh, is because it's floating. And so you can look at it varying in time. It tells you how much is being melted from the surface, from the bottom, how much is being stretched. Um, and then you can also use uh, airborne or ground radar to, to, to look at that. But mostly I'm a physical photographer, so I'm going on cruises in Antarctica. And I use a series of tools and I use numerical models. And the tools that I've been using that uh, are, you know, the coolest, I guess, uh, have been the, the really big AUVs like AutoSub uh, 3 uh, displayed here. I think the picture on the bottom left is uh, from 2009 in, the, in front of Panayam Glacier in the Amundsen Sea uh, and 2014 uh, in, the, in the, the wider uh, picture. Uh, and then I've also uh, been involved in launching the Gavia uh, AUV, which is a smaller, not as small AUV under the Nansen Ice Shelf. Uh, which is a partial success, let's call it that way. So for partial failure. Uh, and then um, the, the most recent uh, development is, you know, these big AUVs are great because they give you a great, uh, it's a great tool to explore cavities, uh, but they only do that for, you know, one or two days. Uh, they have a large payload. So of course the next step is to uh, use uh, more persistent uh, AUVs to explore cavities for an extended amount of time and look at you know, seasonal variability uh, into this system, which is supposed to be large. Um, and so the last thing, uh, last year, last summer, I deployed uh, with working with a group at APL, a tools that are very familiar to you here, 
the SIG lighter, uh, three SIG lighters in front of the dots on eye shelf, and uh, four uh, EM Apex floats. And we use acoustic beacons for geolocation when sea ice uh, was covering it. And they've been uh, roaming the area, going under the ice shelf uh, and out for about a year. And uh, we're getting great results from, from, from that. And one is still alive, and uh, a few others uh, uh, have been sending data and are now on the brink of death. Thank you. Okay, next up is Michael Brown. All right. There you go. Hi, everybody. I'm a PhD student uh, at DMCS. Oscar is my supervisor. My PhD is on phytoplankton ecology along the West Antarctic Peninsula, and my work is a part of the Palmer Long Term Ecological Research Project. Black box up there shows you the spatial extent of the Palmer LTR sampling grid. Palmer Station is in the northern part of that uh, box. <clears throat> There's two main types of phytoplankton in this region diatoms, which are typically considered to be large, and the classic Antarctic uh, phytoplankton type, and then cryptophytes, which are a smaller type. And if you plot diatoms and cryptophytes in temperature salinity space, in that figure right there, the green circles are cryptophytes, and you can see they show up in low salinity water. And so it's hypothesized that as we continue to melt this region, cryptophytes will increase in abundance. And <clears throat> um, given cryptophytes are small, this could have an impact on the food web um, because krill are not able to efficiently feed on them. And so. Um, the focus of my thesis has been looking at what might be the driver behind uh, cryptophytes in low salinity water and how um, a shift in species composition might impact biogeochemistry. So one thing that we've been doing is looking at trends in upper ocean physics and biogeochemistry uh, in this region. The LTR has now exceeded 25 years of data. Um, and so this figure here is showing you that over the past quarter century, Mixed layer depth has decreased, chlorophyll has increased, and delta PCO2 has decreased. Another way to say that is um, upper ocean stability has driven an increase in phytoplankton biomass, which has impacted the way that the ocean is taking up um, ocean or CO2. And what's interesting is that a lot of the CO2 uptake is associated with diatoms and not cryptophytes. Something else we're interested in is assessing the chemical content of glacial meltwater. Um, to get at what might be the driver behind this association of cryptophytes and low salinity water. And so this is data from two streams behind Palmer Station. Um, the brown colors here are showing you the chemical content of the meltwater relative to the seawater. And what's interesting is that relative to seawater, this meltwater has high uh, orders of magnitude higher trace metals, uh, iron, copper, and these. Um, and low silicate. And so this has implications for what might be driving species composition and phytoplankton um, in this coastal area. And finally, so this data, this is the same plot from before. This data is from Palmer Station. If you plot diatoms and cryptophytes um, in TS space over the entire grid, this relationship doesn't hold up. And cryptophytes don't segregate out in low salinity water. This suggests that there's likely different types of cryptophytes. And we haven't been able to assess that thus far because we use pigments, which don't get you to a high taxonomic resolution. And so the final chapter of my thesis is looking at cryptophyte diversity using 18S sequencing to get you a finer taxonomic resolution. Okay, so uh, we misunderstood uh, Oscar. He's not coming, but uh, so... Um this is uh, Philip. There you go. Hi, uh, my name is Phil Sante, postdoctoral associate here at Rutgers. Um, done most of my research in environmental sciences. So we are here along the West Antarctic Peninsula, where we've collected uh, krill, both juvenile and adults, and we measured uh, methylmercury. Uh, the form of mercury in the environment that biomagnifies in food webs and is of more of an environmental concern than total mercury, which is that in the inorganic species. Main take home of this figure is that we found both higher concentrations in methyl mercury and total mercury in juvenile krill in a uh, transect near Anvers Island, near Palmer Station, going from um, 
up in the north part of the peninsula, and we also found the same trend um, in the southern part near the sea ice edge, suggesting a very limited uh, direct influence on methylmercury accumulation in krill. But one interesting um, trend that we found was that the annual sea ice conditions seem to have a large influence both on the water column stability, thus driving primary uh, production, and also that primary production formation of that POM could be influencing uh, accumulation of these trace metals in uh, both juvenile and adult krill, where juveniles are feeding in subsurface waters, where we feel that there's higher concentrations of methylmercury available for them. So to look at these, uh, this timing and the, the importance of sea ice dynamics on biogeochemistry and bioaccumulation, uh, a model is needed. So we're looking to do work with an ocean atmosphere model that will look at large-scale climate variability, specifically the influence of sand modulation on um, both La Nina and um, El Nino uh, conditions and the uh, control of that uh, SAM index on the sea ice formation and subsequently uh, uh, POM formation. So in this scenario, positive SAM, La Nina conditions, low sea ice, um, increased uh, 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 lower water column stability and driving low POM formation, which could influence um, trace metal uh, biogeochemistry and also um, the production of juvenile krill. And it's a recent paper by Atkinson et al. that showed that the SAM index has a large influence on the mean uh, juvenile recruitment density. So the juvenile krill less than 30 millimeters long is largely influenced by what's going on in the SAM between January and September. So it has uh, this climate, large scale climate, has an impact um, all the way from water column stability up to um, ecology and krill. Okay. Oh. Right. Next up, John. Okay. How you doing? Uh, we're looking at the gut microbiome inside krill, so krill have been introduced. Why are we doing this? Well, it was initially motivated by our interest in mercury transformations, which are very strongly affected by anaerobic processes, processes car carried out by bacteria and archaea that live where there's no oxygen. And one of the interesting features about coastal areas around the Antarctic, as opposed to all the other coastal areas of the world, there's not a lot of anoxic space supporting reducing conditions. And so in our search for anoxic space, one of the places is in fact inside the digestive tract of zooplankton. There's been some work with copepods showing that their digestive tract is anoxic and potentially supports anaerobic microorganisms. In addition, there's been some work, oh, I'll get to that in a second. So that means you could support biogeochemical processes like nitrate reduction, iron reduction, sulfate reduction, potentially even methanogenesis. And those are processes that normally we would think about occurring in an estuarine sediment area or, or a continental shelf sediment area, or maybe the uh, ox oxygen minimum zone of the North Pacific, for example. And we just don't have those spaces uh, on the coastal seas of the Antarctic. So we're looking for other places, and this is one place we're looking. Uh, in addition to uh, finding uh, some bacteria, some anaerobic bacteria, there have been some suggestion that the accumulation of methylmercury, we heard about methylmercury, that's the developmental neurotoxin that we're worried about accumulating in mammals and birds, is accumulated by copepods in the Arctic to a higher level than the f amount that they're eating. So there's some suggestion that there's formation of methylmercury inside the copepods themselves. In addition, there's a recent paper that's in one of these new um, preprints. It's an archive, so it's a preprint. Um, but they did report identifying the gene res uh, that's responsible, that's just required for mercury methylation in Baltic sea copepods. So there are a few pieces that are out there leading us to the hypothesis 
is there methylmercury formation inside of krill and or other anaerobic processes? So we've started to look at the gut microbiome. We have some uh, initial results that are just looking at the community of microbes. There are uh, classes of microorganisms and even genera of microorganisms that we know are anaerobic microorganisms. Some of them are the genera that carry the uh, mercury methylation gene. So we're interested in connecting those dots. I've, you can't see them here. I can tell you about them later, the bacterioidetes and the firmicutes. Um, we also noticed that the communities are different from uh, pooled samples of krill from different parts of the uh, West Antarctic Peninsula where we collected samples Phil was telling you about earlier. And so that's also interesting, but we want to um, put together the genes with the organisms through a metagenome and that work is ongoing. Great, thank you so much. Next up, from krill to penguin food. All right. Thank you. Uh, my name is Josh Kohut. I'm uh, in marine and coastal sciences, and I'm actually a physical oceanographer. So my definition is penguin food, but I understand people who study it actually call it krill and phytoplankton. Um, we're interested in working through a large team to try and understand the connections from penguins through the food web down to the physical oceanography that I love. The place that we're studying is, as you've heard a lot this morning already, is the West Antarctic Peninsula. It's interesting because it has supported penguin colonies in, in many of these places for, we estimate, over thousands of years. Uh, there are these hot spots that are associated with these deep canyons that are hypothesized to deliver goodies from the deep ocean, namely UCDW, it's a particular water mass, as part of the Antarctic circumpolar current, delivered to this place, provides an incubator, phytoplankton grow, krill are happy, penguins are happy. Um, what we wanted to do was understand what those actual mechanisms were. So we brought a lot of the tools that we use in mid-latitudes to the Antarctic. And as I mentioned, it's a large team. This component of a project was to bring gliders. We could fly them in this canyon system, hypothesized to be a hot spot. If we fly them in this way, we can look and see how stationary change versus spatial change occurs. And what we found is when we looked at the data in the surface of the ocean, it didn't matter if our glider was going along a canyon, across a canyon, or staying in the same place. The behavior of both temperature and backscatter were similar, meaning this surface layer was really isolated from the canyon below. The other tool we brought down was HF radar. And this picture was taken on one of the best days I've ever had at work in my life. Uh, it's a really spectacular spot. We had to figure out how to bring an, a piece of equipment that required a lot of energy and communication to run to an island where we were likely the first people to step on it. Right? So we set up this HF radar system, which essentially allows us to map ocean currents. So we can see where fronts and eddies are occurring. We can tag penguins and see where they go relative to these features. And what we found, one of the conclusions, was looking at something called residence time. How often would particles in these velocity fields stay in that place? And what we found is in the surface ocean, it's two days or less. So these things are getting flushed out, these surface things. So if phytoplankton are in that surface layer, we know that surface layer doesn't know the canyons there, at least in the summer. And we know that material in that surface layer is exiting within two days, which is a problem when it takes seven to 70 days for phytoplankton to grow, right? So we think there are other mechanisms at place. And so we're excited with a large team that includes uh, Rutgers, Fairbanks, Delaware, OSU, Polar Ocean Research Group, Jerusalem College of Technology, and now Old Dominion, we're gonna be bringing all these tools in this next season. We're adding a model, it's a one kilometer model, run by uh, Mike Dinneman and John Klink at Old Dominion to try and understand now we have some hypotheses of what the mechanisms could be. Oh great, now it's my turn. I think I'm gonna turn off the clock. And <laughs> just, <laughs> I'm just kidding. Uh, let me pull this up.
Okay, my name is Olsa Renamalm and I'm going to take, tell you about my work about the Greenland ice sheet surface hydrology. Uh, I want to start by uh, introducing you to my team. I have really amazing people working with me and you will hear from uh, many of them today. So uh, why are we studying the Greenland ice sheet? This is a, a little video from one of our field sites in Greenland and also this video is not running all the way to the end like Rebecca's unfortunately. <laughs> Uh, if it was, you would see the Greenland ice sheet appearing uh, behind this river and, uh, and eventually would go up into the ice and you'll see melting occurring there. So the point of us showing this is that meltwater from the Greenland ice sheet is one of the leading causes of global sea level rise. And, and that's why we study it, uh, this kind of meltwater runoff. Not all meltwater that melts on the surface of the Greenland ice sheet makes its way to the ocean. Uh, some of it will infiltrate into uh, snow layers high up on the ice sheet and refreeze. So here this woman is pointing out a layer of ice within the snow. So um, the research question that me and my team are investigating is about how much of this meltwater that forms on the surface of the ice sheet uh, makes its way to the ocean. Like how is it transported and through uh, its transportation how does it transform the ice sheet itself. So, now I'm going to show you a super complicated figure with a lot of details of the hydrology of, of the Greenland ice sheet. Uh, just to kind of give you an idea, this is actually really complicated. And anyway, so here's a cross section of the Greenland, a part of the Greenland ice sheet, and you see lots of features pointed out here. So the things that we look at in my uh, group, I'll just uh, highlight those. Uh, one thing that we do, we look at uh, fern. This is old snow uh, where meltwater can percolate and refreeze and not escape to the ocean. And so you'll hear uh, some uh, presentations by Jing and Kieran. At the very end, Kieran will do a presentation about our work here. Uh, but we also uh, study meltwater further down on the ice sheet where it forms uh, channels and rivers and streams. And uh, here you'll hear two talks by Sasha and Rohi about work in this area. And finally, uh, we uh, look at water outflow as it escapes the ice sheet and in the pro-glacial rivers and streams. A lot of our work is uh, collecting field data, but we also work a lot with uh, remote sensing imagery and models. So uh, one thing that we do is uh, look at models to look at the entire outflow of fresh water from the Greenland ice sheet. So here is a map classifying all the outlets, outlets of either marine or or land terminating uh, glaciers. And then we can just integrate the annual or daily freshwater flux over different regions and make time series and over different regions. And uh, that's that. All right. All right, thanks. Hey. Hello, I'm Jing Xiao. I'm a PhD student uh, in geography department, and I work with Osa. Uh, so um, today I will talk about meltwater refreezing in the southwest Greenland ash sheet fur. So Osa has introduced to us about the surface melting in Greenland, and those meltwater can either escape to the ocean in the form of runoff, or it can infiltrate into snow and fur and refreeze. And this can act as a buffer against mass loss. But if meltwater keeps refreezing in the fur, we can imagine that one day it will become saturated with ice layers. And there are some studies showing that the storage capacity of fur has already experienced some decrease. So understanding this process is very important for predicting Greenland's future mass balance and its influence to sea level rise. So uh, we drew 10 course. Uh, during the past two field seasons in southwest Greenland. Here's the three sets, and here's a photo of the uh, fur. So maybe we can see here, but we can see in the field the difference between fur and ice. So we measured the course length, weight, depth, and recorded the location of ice layers and ice pipes. And based on this data, we estab established the density profile and stratigraphy of the course. Here's the 10 cores. The left two are from the first set, the middle six from the second set, and the right two from the third set. And the elevation of the sites decreases from the left to the right. 
and, and the black line is the density, and the blue horizontal lines is, are the, the S layers. So what we try to look at here is the distribution of ice layers in the firm core. So here's some brief take-home messages. So first, our results confirm that um, ice layers um, take up a considerable portion of the firm core from 5% um, to 32%. And the percentage is higher at a lower elevation where more melting happens. Also, um, the previous um, melt events can be seen in the firm structure. For example, the, the thick ice layer um, at the depth of two to three meters in the second and third set course is a product of the most recent extreme melt events in 2010 and 2012. And that's all, thank you. Fantastic, you get prize for, um, for finishing early. Uh, okay, uh, Rui. Uh, hello everyone, uh, I'm Rohi Mutiala. I'm a PhD student from Geography Department and I work with Elsa Renema. And uh, you've already heard from Elsa why we study the surface runoff from Greenland Ice Sheet. And I am studying at the superglacial stream network that carry this meltwater uh, in the form of runoff from the surface. And uh, uh, to study these stream networks, well, we collect uh, 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 field data from the southwest Greenland in a small catchment that's shown in the right figure. And uh, the cat this is how the catchment looks like. And uh, in the left figure, you can see Sasha collecting the stream discharge. And we collect both hydrological and meteorological data. Uh, and we also collect UAV imagery for uh, generating a DEM for analysis. And uh, this is uh, Smith et al. Uh, this is a paper uh, which has the only comparison uh, between the observations and model discharge so far. And what it shows is that the observations in red are, uh, um, and the models are shown in uh, the other colors, and the models do a terrible job of simulating the observations. And you can see they are highly overestimating it, and even they, ca uh, they, can the, um, they can't um, get the uh, time to peak discharge as well. So, but what we find in our study is that the models don't do such a bad job. Uh, this is the study, uh, this is the model I run uh, for over two months compared to the model from uh, the previous study. That's over just three days. And our model shows the average bias of around 8.5%. And it does a fairly good job of simulating the discharge over the whole melt season. Uh, but we also have some of those days where it overestimates or underestimates. And uh, to improve these underestimations and overestimations, I would like to uh, introduce these missing parameterizations from the current models. And some of these parameterizations are meltwater routing. Um, and what is this meltwater routing? The meltwater generated on the surface, uh, it doesn't take the same time. All the particles, they don't take the same time to reach the outlet. Uh, the bigger the catchment, there's more time it takes to reach the outlet. And if we do not consider routing, uh, there is that peak, uh, lag in the time to peak we notice in the current models. And uh, by introducing this parameterization, we would be avoiding it. And same as that, uh, subsurface storage. This water is stored in the top two meters uh, of the surface called weathering crust. And uh, that's how it looks like, the surface storage with all the cryoconite holes. And it stores a lot, large amount of water. And without this parameterization, even the current models overestimate and underestimate. And the last thing is channel incision. And by including these parameterizations, I, um, uh, I intend to uh, run the models and uh, also expand the spatial extent. Thank you. Okay, great. All right. Hello, everyone. Uh, my name is Sasha, uh, PhD student in the geography department, working with OSA. Uh, and I'm going to be talking to you about superglacial streams and why they might be causing an acceleration in the amount of meltwater uh, being contributing uh, from Greenland. 
So this is our, our, one of our field sites. Uh, it's a superglacial stream in southwest Greenland. As you can see, it's, uh, the water is significantly darker uh, and contains a lot of sediment that makes the albedo of the stream itself uh, significantly uh, lower than the surrounding ice. Uh, and so my research is looking at how we can use hydrologic modeling to uh, predict what the uh, size and effective albedo will be under different melt regimes. So uh, we collect a whole bunch of uh, different measurements in Greenland, including discharge and velocity measurements, um, grain size distribution of the sediment in the stream, um, GPS measurements that I took uh, along the stream bed to interpolate bathymetry, uh, and drone imagery. All of this goes into a HECRAS uh, hydrologic model in order to predict what the size of the stream will be, where sediment is going to be distributed, um, and what is the resulting albedo from our hypo, hyperspectral um, imagery analysis. And so the, the idea is to use this model to um, take in a, a, a climate parameters and be able to um, see what the resulting uh, uh, extent of the, the positive feedback loop for albedo. Uh, so already getting some preliminary results. Um, so our the sediment analysis is shown um, the, the circles are the percent sediment cover for a given cross-section. Um, and those cross-sections, we took uh, velocity measurements to get what the stream uh, bed roughness is. And the, what we see is that the bed roughness uh, increases significantly when you have sediment deposition. Um, so not only is the sediment causing more melting because it's significantly darker than the surrounding ice, but also it's um, causing that water to be held back longer, uh, having more friction, and so longer routing times, which also causes more melting of the surface. Also, um, with the uh, aerial imagery that we take with the drones that we collect, we've been de developing a method of improving our classification scheme so that we can actually find where these streams are located. Uh, and we, what I've found is that um, when we apply a shadow correction model to the imagery that we collect, uh, we significantly improve the classification of our images. So you can see that on the left is the uncorrected image uh, that has shadows that end up being classified as sediment that don't when you're correcting them. Um, so just the overall conclusion is that when you're actually considering these superglacial streams in your uh, model, you can kind of lead to a positive feedback loop that can greatly improve what our estimates are for Greenland's contribution to sea level rise. Thank you. Great, thank you so much. Um, yeah, so uh, we're switching between uh, um, PDFs and uh, PowerPoints because uh, the PowerPoints were better with video, obviously we didn't do that super well. But so if there's any of the upcoming like presentations that had video in them that we didn't catch, uh, please let me know because then I'll pull up your PowerPoint instead. Have you have a video? For example, the next speaker. <laughs> uh, so uh, let's see. Uh, yeah, it's was a Wang. Yeah. Yeah. There we go. Down there. Yeah. Uh, so my name is Shuni Wong. I'm a grad student at BMCS. I work with blockchain. You are here from here. Sure. Okay. So I'm gonna tell you how to model subglacial discharge, uh, more like in general, not only in tide water glacier fjords. So uh, I guess by this point you have know what tide water glacier fjords. So I can skip a lot of stuff. So. Uh, uh, long story short, uh, subglacial discharge is going to drive uh, strong upwelling and form this buoyant plume near glacier head. And along the way, it pick a lot of uh, fjord deep water and transport to the surface. So this has a very strong biological impact because it mixes all the nutrients to the surface. And uh, it has been shown that this also have, uh, like, uh, well, enhanced the melting of the glaciers. So this is interesting. Can we model it? 
But unfortunately, this process is very turbulent and not hydrostatic. So a hydrostatic model like the original ocean modeling system, ROMs, won't be able to, to resolve it. So instead, we just parameterize this uh, buoyant plume using the buoyant plume theory and uh, couple it with ROMs. So the idea is you read a uh, sub discharge and you read the ambient condition from the ocean model and uh, you calculate the buoyant plume and uh, using the, the theory, right? And then you terminate the plume at some depths that you find and then you detrain the plume back to the ocean model using some detriment parameterization. Uh, so this way we don't lose a lot of, uh, uh, we can just save some computational time without turning on the hydro, uh, like hydrostat, non hydrostatic mode for like most ocean models. So, okay, we have that, we're happy. And uh, how does it work? So we test the model with the uh, idealized uh, rectangular fjord basin with the sail towards the mouth of the fjord and uh, the glacier is on the left side. Subglacial discharge is injected right at the in the middle of the of the glacier. Uh, hopefully this works. Okay, so oh, yeah, here, there, hey, there, here. Yeah, I see it. No, 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 no? right now. Oh, sorry. Yeah. Okay. I messed up. You got nope. extra minutes. <laughs> awesome. Okay, you can hear from me. Uh, so, I, what, what, what I'm showing here is, uh, is the model output, and uh, uh, just focus on the lower two panels. Uh, I'm showing salinity along the transect and uh, the, the dye concentration of subglacial runoff at the ocean surface. So, when the model begins, when the simulation begins, you can see a strong outflow forming from the surface, and uh, the dye the dye of subglacial runoff just quickly occupies the surface and transport outward. It got 30 seconds. Okay, so it forms this strong exchange flow near the sail, and uh, which Bob is going to talk about it later. And uh, uh, while well, the model did what we wanted to do, great. So we can use it to study, for example, how, how everything responds to subglacial discharge. We run some simulation with the uh, different subglacial runoff, and uh, I'm running off of time, so, so this completed. is my thank you page. <laughs> okay, who's next? All right, Jim. Oh, let's go back to the PDFs. All right, we can see uh, that the Arctic Ocean is pretty much surrounded almost completely by land. And it turns out that uh, there's a lot of uh, river runoff that gets into the Arctic. And in fact, about 10% uh, of the global river runoff goes into the Arctic, which is about 1% of the area of the total ocean. So, uh, I have a couple colleagues. I'd like to mention specifically two uh, undergrads who have worked with this project uh, through the undergraduate uh, RESTI research program, John Fuller and Samantha Chang. And John is here somewhere, so we also have undergrads here. <clears throat> All right, so if you think about uh, the rivers, what we've done back in the 90s actually, looked at the major river basins in the world in a global climate model. And that's on the upper right. And you can see all those different colors represent the major river basins in the world. And one of the most robust conclusions that we've come to, we found uh, based on how these run how the runoff might change in the future by the end of the century is that all the high latitude rivers that flow into the Arctic, that whole region, significant increasing runoff. And more recent uh, simulations by other groups looking at this have pretty much confirmed that. So this is a very robust result. So that's going to have implications on what's going on in the Arctic. And I want to give a couple examples of uh, Arctic amplification, which we've also worked on in the past, 
elevation dependent warming, which essentially is, if you look at the literature, in a lot of high elevation regions, mountains, climate changes at different rates, at different elevations. So two basins in particular, the Mackenzie on the left and up in Canada, and uh, what you see here is the Mackenzie River, that's elevation on the right, and the, the darkest area is the highest elevations, and here are the projections of temperature change by the end of the century in winter, and what you can see is there's both a latitudinal and a uh, also change with the change with elevation, which I'll show a slide in a minute. Eastern Siberia, these are the projected temperature changes with the uh, high emission scenario by the end of the century. And here's an example of Arctic amplification in these two basins. In the, in the, uh, on the left, you see Eastern Siberia. And this, the latitude goes from 50 degrees on the left to 70 degrees on the right, and what you can see is that the temperatures are going to be increasing with latitude in both the uh, eastern Siberia and in the Mackenzie River Basin in winter. Hi, I'm Marie. I'm a PhD student in Marine and Coastal Sciences, and I work with Jim Miller. And I study the uh, rapid freshwater accumulation in the Beaufort Gyre, which is located in the Canadian Basin. It is the largest freshwater reservoir in the Arctic Ocean. Uh, the amount of freshwater does not remain constant. It can accumulate or release, and the main driver behind that is the atmospheric circulation. So during times when the atmosphere is circulating in an anticyclonic manner, freshwater tends to accumulate, and when, it, uh, when the atmosphere changes to a cyclonic circulation, freshwater tends to be released. Now if you look on the right, um, where you see the, the blue, that is times of freshwater accumulation, and the red are times of freshwater release. Previously, these atmospheric uh, circulation regimes would switch between five and seven years, uh, however, freshwater has been accumulating, or the atmosphere has been favorable to freshwater accumulation since 1996. Um, so, in 2007, uh, in September of 2007, beginning and ending in December of 2008, the Beaufort Gyre accumulated 3,100 cubic kilometers of freshwater, and this represents a 15% increase, and this is unprecedented. So, our question is why did this happen and what does this mean for the future of the Arctic? Uh, in order to do this, we use an ocean reanalysis where we implement Lagrangian particles, um, and we have 20 years worth of data for that, and we compare those results to in situ observations from moorings. Uh, if you look on the right, one of the moorings recorded a very strong freshwater pulse in September of 2007, and that's when the Beaufort Gyre started to accumulate this fresh water. So we also want to know how are these two events uh, related. So we seeded these Lagrangian particles in our uh, ocean reanalysis, and we invected them during the time of the, the melt season. Um, this is where we seeded the particles in the Mackenzie River Basin, and we found that in 2007, that was the only year where these uh, particles advected directly into the Beaufort Gyre. Uh, during this time period, the Mackenzie River only released about 600 cubic kilometers of freshwater, um, and our um, data is showing 3,100 cubic kilometers of freshwater. So the Mackenzie Basin is not the end, of, or not the total story. Um, so we also looked at the Bering Strait. We seeded Lagrangian particles. Uh, at three different sites, and again we see in 2007 they directly uh, went into the, the gyre. 2007 was the only year where the Mackenzie River water and the waters from the Bering Strait converged, uh, which triggered a massive sea ice melt event. Therefore, solar heating at the surface increased, which caused the previous, or the next year for the melt season to begin two months early. So in the future, we are planning to look at uh, Siberian River runoff um, and see how, uh, 
how that also affects freshwater in the Beaufort Gyre. Thank you. Great, thank you so much. And now, this is Bob Champ. Okay, thank you. Uh, I want to make a few simple statements about uh, fjord circulation from the perspective of an, est of an estuarine dynamicist. And, uh, and before I get knocked out at the bell, um, I, I just want to get a little bit of punchline, which is that mixing is really important. Okay. So, um, so the simplest thing you can say about fjord circulation is that, is that that, that inflowing layer is going to, is going to be proportional to the, to the um, river, the freshwater flux is divided by the salinity difference between the inflowing and outflowing layers. So the, the closer those are together, the more mixing you get, the more exchange flow you're going to get. The more inflowing of heat, the more inflowing of, 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 of um, nutrients you're going to get the fjord. So the simplest, so one extreme with that would be, say, in the case of, uh, if you had no subglacial discharge, just a surface of fresh water with no mixing, no wind, or no tides, the fresh water would just slip out on top of the fjord, and it would require no inflowing layer, and that lower, that the ocean would bring in no heat or no nutrients to the fjord. In the other case, if you had extreme mixing, um, lots of wind, lots of subglacial discharge, um, you would have a lot of exchange, and, um, and that would bring in lots of heat and lots of nutrients to the fjord. So you can see the difference between a land terminating and a, and a, and a, and a marine terminating uh, freshwater fluxes into a fjord. So those kind of simple ideas um, are just a, a statement of conservation of salt and, 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 uh, uh, and fresh water. Um, the other physics that we can bring into the problem are, are, um, are momentum. And, and if you look at, if you use an, est an estuary, an estuary uh, theory is um, a momentum of a theory to use to explain exchange flow. Um, so up here shows a, a salt field in an estuary, and this is a Hudson, it used to be a fjord 8,000 years ago, not anymore. But, but if you look, the first, the first equation says that the exchange flow is actually inversely proportional to mixing, um, but also related to the salinity gradient. Um, but the salinity gradient is, in fact, um, proportional to mixing, so in the end, the exchange flow in an estuary is independent of mixing. Okay, and that that's sort of um, counterintuitive to what, what, what the first um, equation, the first uh, set of slides shows. And so the question is, does this really work? Does it work in estuaries? Does it work in fjords? And the answer, like anything else, is it depends. And so again, I'm going to go to an estuary, and 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 this on the on the on the right there, what we see is an opportunity to have an exchange flow from an estuary when it was deepened, and and the, not, the short of it is that the exchange flow doubled when the estuary was deepened, so it didn't behave like it should have because the basin was so short that the salt field couldn't adjust. Similarly, my last slide, fjords. I don't think that the that the, uh, you know, as you increase mixing, um, it's just going to continue to increase the exchange flow, and so the detail of mixing are important. And what I'm interested in with Chunning's models and, and hopefully future field work is what's the relative importance of near field mixing at the, at the, at the plume to larger scale mixing in the fjord by winds and bathymetry and tides. Thank you. Great, thank you so much. Right. Okay, next up, uh, Dave Robinson. Good morning, everyone. I am uh, bringing the polar regions on the land. I think we've heard only oceans and ice sheets up till now. And even bringing polar regions into New Jersey, if you can see from the snow-covered northern Jersey there. I want to acknowledge Tom Estelo, my right-hand person, in talking about a data set. We're going to talk more data set here. Uh, this is a northern hemisphere data set which goes back to the late 60s on northern hemisphere snow cover extent. Not depth, but extent. It, it has evolved over time. It's now a daily product at a higher resolution, but we degrade it still so we can match it with data from the 70s and 80s and 90s. We're actually redigitizing maps now from the 80s and 90s to improve their resolution. But this is the longest continuous environmental satellite data record available for any variable out there. So we play with it after we gather it, and we do many things with it and share it with a variety of users through our center, through the National Snow and Ice Data Center, and through the National Centers for Environmental Information. And you can see the research that can be done with this, uh, the beneficiaries throughout 
um, society, if you will, and it's also used in IPCC and uh, national climate assessments as well. This shows you a map from just the, earlier this week. Uh, the golden areas on the left are snow covered, um, but that's commonplace. The map on the right is unique to our shop. It's the only place where you can see where snow cover shouldn't be there on that date. That's in blue, but it is found this year. And red should have snow cover on the 16th of February, but is not this year. It's kind of a blasé map. It's been a kind of a mesa mesa month in, in for the winter. But we've also looked at it in a time series. This is 12 month running means of northern hemisphere extent. The blue and the red are for the continents. And you can see a stepwise change in the late 80s that stayed down since that time. But if you look at it seasonally, that's declining snow extent in the spring. This is something I first published on in 1990, um, looking at the declined extent. And it's really picked up in the polar regions in particular. First, it was in the middle latitudes in March and April. But May and June, it's really picked up in the last 10 to 15 years. The snow is melting earlier in the spring. We don't see that signal in the fall. We even see some increase in the fall in some areas. And the winter, as I said before, and as you saw, hasn't changed much. But the big change is in the spring. And that's, of course, when albedo factors are greater. Uh, runoff has implications, implications for agriculture and soil moisture. Uh, and even in boreal forest for um, drying out of soils and such and, and wildfire. Um, this is our ongoing work. Um, we're doing a lot of change detection as well as just snow climate interactions. And that's our website. Feel free to visit. Thanks. Thank you so much. And next up is Max. And you could uh, use this yes. one. Or okay. If you need to point. okay. Very good. Thank you. I'm Max Hagbaum from the Department of Biochemistry and Microbiology, and we will stay in soil environments and specifically our interest in uh, understanding subseroactive activity in tundra soils. So we're interested in understanding how seasonal uh, and environmental variation affects the activities of microbes in soils and including things like sub-zero temperatures, freeze-thaw cycles, and so on. But more importantly, how these changes affect their activity and degradation organic matter, which of course then can uh, or will release carbon dioxide. Now, I'm also interested in snow, but in this case, snow as an insulator. And that's shown very nicely in this graph here, showing the effect of snow cover at our Kilpisjärvi uh, study site in northern Finland, where under about a meter of snow, you have a wonderful, very balmy, minus one degree soil temperature throughout winter. A few meters away due to topography, where wind blows away the snow, uh, soil temperatures vary between minus five and minus 25 degrees throughout the winter months. We're trying to understand how this is affecting the activity of microorganisms. And one of the approaches that we've been using this together with Lee Kirchhoff is stable isotope probing. So here using uh, C13 labeled cellobios, we can examine which microbes are assimilating this carbon source during the winter temperatures. And we've been basically looking at, in microcosm experiments in the laboratory, how temperature affects who is active. Zero degrees minus uh, four degrees and minus 16. And the data is shown here in these busy bar graphs. Uh, on the left is the initial soil community. So each color in this graph represents a different uh, phylum of, of the bacterial community. You can see that at zero, whoops, I'm, uh, am I pressing too hard? So uh, at uh, zero degrees, minus four degrees, or minus 16, there are distinctly different members of the acumenine that are assimilating cell bios. And we can see that indeed, also in this PCA plot, that there's a major shift in who is active uh, in these sub temperatures. And with phylogenetic analysis, we can do more detailed evaluation on 
who is there, we've identified actually a new cold active member of the Ignavibacteriaceae, which probably doesn't say anything to anyone other than Lee here, but what was intriguing is all the other known members are from hot environments. What are they doing in these tundra soils active at sub-zero temperatures? We don't know. Again, the question is then, how is this impacting carbon turnover throughout winter months? I'll stop there. Okay, thank you so much. And we're moving on with Lee. Thank you. And thank you to Max for doing such a great introduction. Um, so I'm Lee Kirkhoff, a microbial ecologist in marine and coastal sciences. We like using uh, nucleic acid-based tools to characterize communities, partly their activity, as Max told you, and partly just getting a better understanding of uh, what their patterns look like in the environment. So Max spoke to you a little bit about the study site here in Kilpis Yarvi. And one of the team members is Minna Ministo in the Natural Research Resources Institute of Finland. Minna went out into the Kilpisi RV site in February to sample in these two different areas, snow covered and windswept to take a look at these microbial communities. We like using um, state of the art kind of tools. Turns out there's a handheld DNA sequencer that works on your laptop, which is shown here. It's called the Oxford Nanopore Minion or the Yanks maybe call it minions, and Max put together the slide for me. <laughs> so basically what we're doing is we're getting much higher resolution by targeting the ribosomal operon, not just the 16S gene, which is the most popular target for bacterial characterizations, the entire operon, which gives you much greater resolution. And so um, essentially we have samples from MINA where we have uh, gotten almost a million and a half reads. We can screen this using very simple tools on our laptop. And basically, if I give you the 30,000 foot view, the proteobacteria shown here in blue, the actinobacteria shown in green, the acidobacteria are some of the organisms that are present globally, not just in these art examples, but we're trying to focus in. If you do the PCA type analysis, we can see differences between these communities. But if you dig down deep and start looking at this level of resolution, and we're focusing in on the acidobacteria because they are prevalent everywhere. Very little is known about them. They're extremely difficult to culture. Minna probably has the most extensive culture collection. And we can look at individual species of bacteria at these sites. And so here we have an example of the snow covered. Here we have an example of the, the wind swept. By and large, the patterns are remarkably the same for these different species, but there are differences that can be seen. And so this is an example of the relative abundance kind of shown on a log plot. But what's really nice is Minna has this culture collection that we can also characterize. And so we've been sequencing the operons from, from DNA from these isolates, as well as putting it together in the um, environmental context and can reconstruct these things to get a better understanding of the microbial ecology. Yeah, so hi, I'm Spencer Roth. Uh, I'm in the Environmental Sciences Department working with Tamar Barquet and Jeffrey Schaefer. And we're interested in looking at the impacts of climate change on mercury transformations in wetlands. Um, and specifically, we're interested in the transformation of mercury methylation. So John Reinfelder and Phil Sontag sort of introduced that a little bit earlier. Uh, we're working in a range of wetlands, ranging from the raised bog on the left over here, out to the fen and intermediate sites. So our bog sites are fairly nutrient poor. They only receive nutrients through the form of rainfall. Um, our fen sites actually will receive um, nutrients through surface water or groundwater inputs. Uh, so I said we're studying mercury in this system. How does it get there? Elemental mercury is dissolved in the atmosphere. Uh, it can be oxidized to mercuric mercury and deposited into our wetlands. 
There it can be methylated in the anoxic zone. Uh, so as John was saying, it's an anaerobic process that's carried out by anaerobic bacteria and archaea. And methylmercury is the form of mercury that bioaccumulates in aquatic food webs and poses a public health concern to fish consumers in neurodevelopment, so fetuses and young children. Um, so many of our sites are underlied by permafrost, and what we know is this permafrost is being lost uh, with warming in the Arctic and subarctic. Uh, so our colleague at the University of Massachusetts Lowell, Mark, Mark Hines, has shown that as this warming is progressing, we're moving sort of from right to left on this figure from our nutrient poor bogs to our nutrient rich fens. And what he shows here is that the mercury methylation potential increases as we make that move from nutrient poor to nutrient rich. So we went out and identified a fen type wetland with a groundwater input uh, that created a nice natural nutrient gradient from high nutrients to low nutrients. And what we saw was on the left figure here, uh, the relative abundance of mercury methylating organisms was highest in our nutrient rich site when compared to our nutrient poor site. And then when we did mercury methylation incubations with stable isotopes of mercury, we showed that in the nutrient rich site in blue here, we have uh, a higher mercury methylation rate and we could actually stimulate it by adding more nutrients in the form of sulfate to these sites. Um, so our conclusion uh, for this little portion is that climate change has the potential to increase methylmercury inputs into subarctic aquatic environments. We know this, uh, we also know that permafrost loss and glacial melting increases inputs of mercury that has been stored away, frozen away for eons, uh, exacerbating this conclusion. Great, thank you. Are you gonna say part of your event? Oh, I can mention that, yeah. I just, I just wanna say that uh, Lauren is at the Geological Museum and she did this amazing event a few weeks ago. I mean, partly was, I was there, but no, I'm just kidding. Uh, but <laughs> it was amazing. I mean, it was like 3,000 people yeah. uh, that came and it was, the theme was polar regions. It was, so yes. I just, it was amazing. <laughs> All right, but now it's gonna be a little bit about other things, I think. Yes. So here we go. Uh, yes, thank you for introducing um, the event that we did a couple weeks ago. So I'm at the Rutgers Geology Museum. I'm also in the Department of Earth and Planetary Sciences. Um, my research does focus on uh, deep sea sediment cores in the North Atlantic, but I'm gonna focus on something that's a little bit more um, interesting, which is a project I was involved in this past summer, which is through the program called Polar Trek. And all of you, if you've not heard of this program, this is a great program for all of you for your broader impacts sections of your grant. So if you want to talk about it, please come see me. Um, so I was one of the 12 educators that was selected for 2018. Um, and I was selected to work with a team to go to Switzerland um, in August to study the melting glaciers that were up there. So. Um, I worked with people from different universities. My role in the team was to go on the field work with them um, and participate in the field work. And you can see I am taking measurements in the field. Um, but more importantly, my role was to be the science communicator, to uh, take the science and distill it down and disseminate it to the public in a way that everyone can understand. So this was done through daily blogs, it was done through, you can see a um, picture of the live stream event that we actually did from the side of a glacier uh, to broadcast to lots of school groups and library uh, groups across the country. Um, right now, I am working with taking the research that we did and trying to create lesson plans that can be taken to school groups, um, can be done at informal science education events like at the Geology Museum. So our uh, particular um, research was using drones to get high resolution imagery and then using the program structure for motion to convert those drone, that drone imagery into three-dimensional um, images. So this makes very high resolution like DEM uh, pictures. So what I did, I worked with the team to take those images and then I worked with the makerspace here on this campus to convert those images into 3D printed images. So what you see here, um, this is actually one of the scientists that I went on the, into the field with, 
um, is an actual 3D printed topography of the side of a mountain um, in Switzerland. So I'm working on creating um, lesson plans. You can see here, this part right here is actually like a puzzle piece of the topography where we've created a lesson where the students work with the actual data, measuring and learning how to take a landform that is on a very, very big scale and turn it into data that can then be uh, manipulated by scientists. Um, so we're, I'm still in the process of finalizing the lesson plan for this, but it's super fun. Um, and just, you know, some pretty pictures. Our target was four fields in uh, Switzerland. Uh, you can see some pretty pictures here. And the main point was to try to understand the sliding laws of glacier, which help dictate the future of sea level rise. Um, and then just some, end with some pretty views of the Alps, because it was a lot of fun. And I'd be happy to talk to anyone about the trip. So thank you. <laughs> Great, thank you so much. All right, now to something completely different. <laughs> uh, Matteo, here you go. Hi everyone, I'm Matteo Turilli, I'm an engineer. So I'm going to speak how we use uh, a cyber infrastructure that is not Wi-Fi, I promise. It's just big computers. Uh, to uh, build uh, a set of tools that allows to execute uh, several programs that satisfy several science drivers. So uh, basically we have uh, this big collaboration with, uh, with several scientists and they are interested in uh, basically recognizing features. So you would be counting how many penguins, how many seals, uh, trying to understand the geological features of uh, satellite images, or uh, try to understand uh, where these image, uh, images are uh, located, so geolocation, or uh, mapping features of hydrology or out of these images. So we have what we have here, computational, a ton of images, hundreds of terabytes. We have uh, a lot of tiling and we have a lot of classification. That means these days machine learning, right? Because everyone does machine learning. So, uh, there are underlying features uh, computationally that uh, characterize all of these uh, use cases that are fairly diverse scientifically. So the, t the typical approach is uh, we go in, we build a full end-to-end -end system, uh, it's super flashy, super good, and never works, and uh, it's, when it works, it works only for you and for anyone else. So we try to get out of the paradigm, uh, and uh, so we build a sort of Legos that we call building blocks. And uh, this idea is that uh, these systems uh, on the right, uh, the black one, can be composed uh, differently depending on the use cases. Then you code a little layer on the top of them and they work magically with the biggest computers in the world. So that's actually what we really try to do. And whether we do it is another story. Uh, so what we do for these use cases, so we put together all these uh, Legos and we build this that we call stack. Okay, and the idea is that the scientists uh, uh, provide their terabytes of images, uh, they move them into these infrastructures that have very big computers, and uh, what, he, 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 what this system does is to recognize that you want this kind of analysis pipeline, so it will just instantiate the pipelines, go out, uh, ask for a lot of resources, um, and start to run these pipelines in parallel, so they go very, 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 very fast and a lot, a lot of them, and in, uh, let's say, 20 hours, done. All of your images have been analyzed, and you get the nice results out in the DB. Now, as cool as it sounds, we are not yet there, but we did uh, manage to count how many seals there are on, this, uh, on these images, and everything has been done in 20 hours, and the uh, scientist seems fairly happy. Thank you very much. Thank you so much. A PowerPoint? Yes. yes. Yeah, yeah, totally. Totally. We'll pull it up. I should say that I come from the Rutgers Newark campus, and I'm very much in the social sciences. So yes. I feel like an alien here, and I have no idea what you're talking about, but it sounds <laughs> really fantastic. So good job, Amoy. Well, we look forward to you telling us something interesting. Parchi. No, I'm just kidding. Uh, um, Welcome, 
Welcome to uh, New Brunswick. Glad to have you. And uh, there will be more social science, but not so much, <laughs> unfortunately. I wish there were more. Yeah, okay, here we go. Um, so I'm gonna talk a little bit about my dissertation research here. Uh, the U.S. military is actively involved in the Arctic and Baltic regions, or theaters, which are two strategically relevant geographical theaters where the Russian Federation also operates. Russian military activity in each of these theaters has escalated in the last decade, presenting security concerns to the United States. Um, and these threats are symmetric and asymmetric. So, for example, there's 30 military installations that are being built uh, north of the Arctic Circle. Uh, cold weather transport and weapons upgrades, um, improvements to anti-aircraft missile systems, uh, and massive 30,000 to 80,000 strong SNAP military exercises being conducted by Russia's northern fleet, which is its Arctic military fleet. Um, as well, nuclear-capable missiles have been deployed to both the Arctic and the Baltic regions. And uh, in the Baltics, just quickly, you see evidence of cyber attacks and delegitimation campaigns against the Baltic states. Um, the puzzle, though, is that the U.S. is faced with um, a Russian threat in these two theaters, yet it only pursues a comprehensive strategy in the Baltic region, despite being an Arctic state, therefore an Arctic power. So this leads me to um, a research question, which is, uh, when faced with comparable Russian behavior, what explains the variance in American strategy in the Arctic and the Baltics? Um, gives you a little bit of an example of what Russia is doing. There are um, two theories which potentially explain uh, my question that I'll talk about here today. One is geopolitics, the other is bureaucratic politics. And I've observed um, that the US and its Nordic allies possess relatively weaker Arctic uh, capabilities than Russia, um, meaning that the US could have a hard time counterbalancing uh, Russia there. So the US might be choosing instead um, to focus only on certain threats in other regions of the world, which could be why U.S. officials don't condemn Russian military actions in the Arctic. Um, because taking uh, action could cause the U.S. to bear the burden of dispense, uh, excuse me, defense expenditures um, in the region when it isn't the regional hegemon, uh, and geography, infrastructure, and hard power favor Russia. Um, so maybe soft balancing within geopolitics theory explains it, which is based on a limited arms buildup, cooperative exercises, and or collaboration in regional institutions. Um, bureaucratic politics might also explain it. Uh, so I'm currently researching the interests of our five U.S. armed services as they envision their activities um, in each theater. And I don't need to tell you guys here, um, of course, that the Arctic isn't linear like it is traditionally on a world map. But the military's uh, world map of unified combatant commands does in fact look like that. And so since the Arctic is located across three unified combatant commands versus the Baltics in one, um, this could affect strategic planning by complicating coordination issues. Um, I'm now conducting uh, semi-structured interviews um, with uh, American military officials, politicians, and bureaucrats to figure out what explains this variance in US strategy. Um, so if anyone here knows those kinds of folks, uh, let me know. But anyway, just to conclude, um, while my research looks at Arctic strategic discourse, uh, my field work is primarily done in the lower 48. So it is polar research, but through international relations. Cool. Activity completed. Yeah, so, like so. Thank you so much. Um, sorry, we have uh, food coming in here. I hope, uh, hope it's not too much of a disruption. Uh, you'll appreciate it later when you get to eat. Um, okay, back here. All right, and uh, oh, here we go. Here okay, am. Janice. Thanks, so Good morning, everybody. I'm Janice McDonald. I'm at the Department of Marine and Coastal Sciences. I also am the STEM agent in the Department of Youth Development. I'm going to talk to you a little bit about our Polar Interdisciplinary Coordinated Education Grant. Uh, which has been a three-year grant from NSF, uh, working with Oscar Schofield and Josh Kohut. Uh, we've been working on a model for a couple of years now about how to engage young people in STEM sciences in general. In this case, we're using the polls as an engaging context for them. Um, we started with Josh's work in, Con in Converge, and we've worked with Grace Saba to develop a model where scientists and educators work together to um, achieve these goals of in having kids be excited and engaged in, in science. 
Um, so the, the main goal here, this is our little logic model, is to um, work with scientists to help them communicate their research, have them interact with educators and a, and a lengthy professional development program, and then spend a two-year program engaging with young people to uh, get them involved with working with data and um, creating their own testable science questions from that data. So we've been working with an external evaluator um, to look at this program. Um, as you can see from my map, we have five uh, major sites across the country working with uh, teachers and scientists in those locations. Basically, the program works where we do the intensive professional development. The students work with generally a downloadable data set. So for example, here in New Jersey, we worked with the long-term ecological research program um, to, uh, and their data zoo to be able to interact with the data. The students then come to campus for an on-campus event uh, for a student research symposia where they present a data set that they've downloaded and interpreted um, to scientists here. Many of you in the room have participated in this. Um, our external evaluator is looking at uh, the data across the country and looking at the students' data's usage, how they view scientists as people, their attitudes toward scientific inquiry, and their adoption of scientific attitudes. And we're working on a journal article that's pulling that all together. I also wanted to mention our, um, our LTER program. We do video teleconferences, and we've been able to dovetail these two programs together so that students have been able to see polar scientists interacting in the field. We typically do about seven calls a field season. Um, so far, we involve about 23 educators in a season. That roughly translates to about 1,700 students who we engage with uh, across the country. We get about 50 applicants per year, and we take about 23 of those. And again, these are focused on student-driven uh, questions that uh, the scientists receive um, 24 hours in advance and interact with the students via video teleconference. We've been using Zoom and Skype and things like that to engage. Last thing I'll mention real quick is our polar literacy principles. I encourage you to check those out on our website. Um, these are the things that we, uh, over the course of the years, have um, pulled into a compact package of things that you should know and understand about the polar regions. So our teachers are using this and scientists are using this in their broader impact projects. Thanks. Thank you so much. Activity completed. Okay. All right. You ready? I'm ready. I'm going to okay, make, let's go. Is the, is the oh, that's no, that's the it's the microphone. You can just leave it oh. there. Uh, the pointer doesn't actually really work. I'll use it. <laughs> All right. All right. So I'm Hal Sauls. I'm a sociologist, rounding out the uh, social science component here. Yay. <clears throat> and so, it's for something very different. Uh, kind of the, the global uh, kind of question that I've been addressing. There's been about a third of the world's population lives outside of urban areas, outside of the urban economies, and we don't have a good model for development, for how they kind of gain some level of health, education, welfare, and technology, with the only option is migration. So if you think about sustainability issues and then further enhance by not just the need for development, but climate change, as the most vulnerable populations, you have a third of the world on the move, which addresses sustainability questions about for their communities, as well as for urban areas, growth of slums. So that's the global perspective. What I've been looking at are what are alternative models for development that could provide some kind of sustainability for these kinds of communities and that brought me into the Arctic, for the Alaska Arctic in particular, which has a very different model of institutions and governance and I would argue about sustainability, uh, which date back to Selma the land claims in 1971 for Alaska, in which, unlike the lower 48 reservations, they set up these institutions of corporations in which the natives own their own corporation to manage land, resources, and so for example, the Arctic Slope Regional Corporation, largest one on the North Slope, is a two and a half billion dollar corporation, a multinational corporation in which the revenue flows to uh, local natives. The problem is while this, uh, provide the model for sustainability and indigenous governance of resources, it has also created a dependence on the resources for uh, 
you know, sustainability because of dependence on this, which brings in a whole new set of dilemmas of both needing the resource exploration, which also threatens uh, community development for all the threats there. So this is the kind of the more uh, social science jargon piece to, uh, you know, to let you know that social scientists also can engage in technical terms uh, about the components of the study, about institutions and governance. On the left is the, co is the corporate headquarters in Anchorage, um, the native corporation rivaling any oil corporation. At the same time, you know, they also, these are executives from the corporation out of whaling season down at the bottom. So it's you know, this combination of um, doing that. So some of the students, we've had Arctic Studios to look at the complementarity of development of, you know, outsider-driven development moving into these, corp into these communities and this was about how you, uh, Wainwright can respond to climate change in the face of uh, you know, offshore oil development and use those resources and read all about it. And then what is brought in today is the 1002 area in the refuge, uh, some of you may be familiar with, which has just been opened up for oil exploration. And so that is kind of the question, is it going to transform here on the left, which is what the 1002 looks like now? to Prudhoe Bay on the right, if you can see uh, you know, oil development, and that's what's on the ground now. I do have a question from my co you know, esteemed colleagues, Jim Miller and Dave Robinson. Activity that, uh, completed. Uh, you know, with all due respect for their models, uh, spending the summer dragging boats over a river bottom and being stuck up river because the ice didn't break, uh, we could have used a little more river flow and early ice break this <laughs> year and didn't have it. Sorry. Last thing is, this issue is hitting you know, just last week, a debate on the community. I probably can't read it, so I'll just tell you the president of the corporation, Native, says we need to develop while the rest of this community is saying this is going to destroy our whaling. And it's really tearing up these communities, this debate about how it's playing there, which raises questions about uh, this. So since I've completed, you can watch it. We've got a 20-minute film uh, from the interviews that discuss this. Okay, I am very excited to, uh, this is good? Yeah, yeah. Welcome Donna Gustafsson from the Simrili Art Museum. Thank you. Thank you very much, Osa, for inviting me to this. I have to say my connection to um, the Polish studies at Rutgers, it really dates to my collaboration with Hal Salzman and Osa Renamam. Um, we worked together in 2013-14. We put together an exhibition of the work of Diane Burko. Um, and here's a painting that she did. This painting, um, as you can see, is called Peterman Calving, April, I mean, August 16, 2010, after NASA, 2012. So she painted this painting in 2012, but she painted it directly after a photograph uh, that she got from the NASA site, which was dated August 16, 2010, and referred to the um, calving of the Peterman um, ice sheet and it's um, floating off into the, into the ocean. So um, Osa and Hal and I worked with Diane Burko, who is an artist who lives in Philadelphia. She has been working with climate change and issues of especially the polar ice caps, uh, north and south, for the last 10 years. She's very much involved in the science. She keeps up with scientists and um, does as much reading and traveling as she can. So in 2013, she was selected to join other artists and scientists and journalists on a trip to the Arctic that was sponsored by the nonprofit organization, The Arctic Circle. Um, and it was these paintings and photographs that she took on her expeditions, both to the Arctic Circle and also to Antarctica the year before that we used for our exhibition at the Zimmerling. Um, so not only did we do this exhibition of her paintings and photographs, we also put together a series of talks that had to do with how um, climate change information and data had been transformed into images, into music, into sculpture, and sort of had entered the public realm um, in those sorts of ways. Um, so while we focused on the work that she did um, that has to do with glacial melt and sea level rise, she also um, works within the tradition of 19th century landscape painting, which is really a search for the sublime in nature. 
Um, Diane's, pa oops, sorry. Diane's paintings are large. The painting that I just showed you is five feet by six feet. And what she means to do is to overwhelm the viewer by presence, not by the information that they contain. So she focuses on the large picture. And what I'm showing you now is um, an image of her painting, as well as the image of the original photograph from which she gathered the data to make her painting. Um, she tries to focus on the large picture, not the details. Um, and she thinks that what she is doing is calling attention to the actual ways that we can see climate change happening. And in that way, she tries to um, get away from all the distracting political debates that happen so often in the public realm when we try to talk about climate change and, and who's responsible or what can be done. Um, for Diane, it's a way, art is a way of um, cutting directly to the chase. Um, as far as she sees it, landscapes are changing, the glaciers are melting, sea levels are rising, and people need to really uh, know about it and do something. She believes she can contribute to the public dialogue by learning from research in the field. She's um, interested in bearing witness to the actual phenomenon and then processing that information. Um, so th this is a quote. She says, quote, I see myself as a subversive artist, creating compelling images which in turn inform the public of the dire threats facing our planet. Um, so this painting um, was recently given to the art museum, so we're delighted to have it now in our collection and we look forward to showing it more often. Um, I invite all of you to think about the Zimmerli Art Museum as a place for collaborative presentations of the research that you're doing and the way contemporary artists are trying to incorporate that information into what people really understand about science. So we're an educational arm of your research facilities and um, I hope that we can work together in the future. Thank you. Thank you. Wonderful. Okay. Um, oh, wait a minute. Is it the P? Presentation. It's, it's presentation, right? Yes. Okay, we have uh, reached our uh, final uh, presentation, and uh, I'm just going to like pull it up. Where are we? Here. And, and it's my uh, pleasure to introduce Karen Rogers. Uh, Karen is an artist and a student at the Mason Gross uh, School. And uh, she joined, she was part of uh, the expedition that I did, uh, Sasha was on it too, uh, uh, in 2018. And she's gonna give you her perspective on this. Okay, hi everyone. Um, we're almost done, you can eat soon, don't worry. Um, so I hope that my presentation can be a little bit of a break. I'm basically just gonna be asking you, instead of displaying my physical research, just asking you to think about your research in a more abstract way. Um, I'm a BFA student at Mason Gross School of the Arts. I major in filmmaking. I have a minor in environmental studies. I'm very thankful to be here and for all the opportunities that OSA has given me. I'm not really used to doing talks like this. I just gave my first presentation at AGU in DC, which was also thankful to, to OSA. So I'm gonna be starting by saying uh, this past year, I went to Greenland on an expedition with OSA and her team of researchers. And this isn't something that is very common for artists to get to do. Um, something that I kind of paralleled it to is a residency. And if you're not familiar with this concept, uh, basically it's when a team of artists are sent to an isolated location and they are able to take in the world and use their art to understand the world around them and to kind of use it as a sort of artistic lens or filter. They're able to take the context of the world, something that's totally objective, and transform it and understand it more through the art that they, cre they create. And on this expedition, I tried looking at it from the standpoint, uh, taking the science that these scientists are doing and using my art to comprehend. But I also tried taking it a step further and I played with the idea of maybe there's also another lens that exists and that's that you might have. And this is through like a scientific lens where you're able to break it down to statistics, maps, in order to understand the world around you. And in this way, I sort of started to really understand that there is a nirvana in the understanding of the world through art and the understanding of the world through science. And I really think 
that through taking both of these filters, it can help us as artists, as creatives, and as scientists. And I won't read all of this because I don't have the time, um, but basically my goal for this project was to understand the context, subtext, and history, both in the relationship um, of the Inuits and uh, the Denmark people in Greenland in a political standpoint, and to take the history and the statistics and that come from the measurements of the melting ice periods and the research through FERN. And I wanted to take this and be able to understand the statistics through the FERN and apply it to the implications of what that means in a further point of view. And this might sort of broaden your definition of what art means, because art can be through an artistic point of view, or it could also be poetic, and it can be philosophical. And it can be taking these statistics that you're working with, these numbers, and applying them to an understanding of what that truly means. For me, it was taking the information of these melt periods and understanding the disappearing history that's occurring, understanding the really traumatic effects that it's having on the Greenland ice sheet. And through this, I was able to, as an artist, more intensely understand the science and objectivity of the issues in the context of the melting, uh, the melting uh, ice sheet and the rising sea levels. And I was also able to understand the political climate and the scientific numbers and measurements. And basically what I'm offering you is that perhaps if we try to see science and art as a nirvana, as something that work together, perhaps we can have a more fine-tuned understanding of the research that we're pursuing. Yeah. And I have a short video for you that I conducted um, within my research. And it, was sort, it sort of stood as a way to digest the information, as a way to understand the history and context, but also apply it to an artist standpoint. Yeah, sure. Uh, of course, I don't know which. This one, yes. And this is a smaller piece of a video that I'm continuing to work on with Oso. I hope I can expand. It's only a minute. It won't be too long. So much, Karen. Can I also just say that she not, did not just do uh, the video for this video. She, uh, the poem, of course, is her, and the music as well. So she can do everything. Yes. Uh, so fine. I want to thank you all. Thank you so much for coming today. I hope you enjoyed it as much as I did. I am like blown away of of like the breadth and and width of, of what what kind of polar work goes on at Rutgers. So thank you so much for making this uh, such a great day. Uh, we have a, a lunch now and. Uh, I invite you to have some lunch and uh, stick around and talk. There was no time for questions, so now's the time to, to uh, chat. And, uh, and please uh, stay on for, for uh, the talk at 1.30 with uh, Rick Forrester about uh, the lurking water underneath the surface of the Greenland ice sheet. Okay, thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you.